Hi there. Today I want to talk about a project I did for around the house. I put up a few shelves for potted plants and wanted to create a lighting system for one of them. My desire was to have a series of LED grow lights that would come on in the morning and then turn off in the evening automatically. The first thing I researched was the LEDs themselves. Not knowing much about LED efficiency or how to drive them, I bought these LEDs off eBay. They are 1 watt LEDs in blue, which is 465 nanometers, and red, which is 660 nanometers. The colors had different forward voltages, so I had to find a way to drive them. 2.2 to 2.8 volts for the red, and 3.6 to 3.8 volts for the blue. This now leads me on to the power supply. I chose to use an old computer power supply to power this project, which I'll make a separate video about. Computer power supplies are handy for the several different voltages they can provide. I decided I would try and drive the LEDs off the 3.3 volt and 5 volt power lines coming off of the power supply. The blue LEDs could be placed on the 3.3 volt bus in parallel. The red LEDs with the 2.2 to 2.8 volt range were a bit trickier. I decided to try and use the red LEDs in pairs. Each pair is connected in series and groups of pairs are connected in parallel. Each pair of red LEDs will divide the 5 volts equally between them, creating the 2.5 volt forward voltage required. Also considering the fact that I would eventually be wanting to power the bulbs through a transistor, which itself will create a small voltage drop, this plan meant that I would never be stressing the LEDs. Okay, now onto the controller itself. I chose an Arduino Mini to be the brain of this project. Of the Arduino Mini range, this is the most powerful one. The 328P chip running at 16 MHz. Peripheral components include two massively overpowered transistors and an optocoupler. The optocoupler is used to turn the power supply on and off. It is not strictly required for this purpose, but as I'd never used one before, I thought this would be a great time to give it a try. The transistors are used to switch the 5 and 3.3 volt lines with the red and blue LEDs. Eventually, I'd like the LEDs to dim when turning on and off, and so a transistor instead of a relay was chosen for this job. Lastly, I installed an override switch, which is monitored by the Arduino in case it is desired to turn the lights on outside of the, o of the programmed range of time. On a side note about the hardware, I built this project on a Vera board and wired the screw terminal block into place to allow me to keep the project modular. This is purely a style choice and has no effect on functionality. I'm hoping to expand the system to a large LED array, and so overbuilding features like that save a lot of time in the future. Okay, now let's take a look at the software. The only non-standard library this controller uses is the Timer1 library, which I will link to below. This library is used to create a clock on board the Arduino using the hardware timer inside the chip. This is useful for helping the Arduino keep track of time and therefore when to turn the lights on or off. The first set of variables deal with the clock, storing the current seconds, minutes and hours. What time to turn the lights on and off are also stored but is constants inside the program. I use two Boolean state variables to store the current state of the controller. Not strictly required but I use them to clean up some of the diagnostics of the system. There are four GPIO pins used. The 5 and 3 pin control the transistors that switch the 5 volt and 3.3 volt lines of the power supply reflect, respectively. The PWR pin is what is responsible for turning the power supply on and off and is connected to the optocoupler described earlier. On to the setup. The setup function takes care of some general Arduino tasks, setting up the pin modes and starting serial communications with the PC for diagnostic purposes. The key function call, calls are to the timer1 class. The first call initializes the timer to trigger every 1 million microseconds, or 1 second. This allows the timer to be used as the basis of the clock. The second fun function call attaches the function clock timer ISR to the timer. Clock timer ISR is a function pointer to an interrupt service routine that we desire to be called every second. Now onto the loop section. The loop section is divided into a few chunks. The first chunk checks the override switch in a simple if-else structure. The key difference here is the analysis of the states inside the if statements. The if not override state statement 
while nested inside the larger if statement is making sure that the code will only continue when on the positive transition of the override switch. This also streamlines the serial.println command, making sure it is only communicated once when the switch is triggered. The next block performs a similar task, but instead of checking the override switch, it checks the time of day and then determines if the lights should be on or off. If the time of day is between the turn on hour and turn off hour, then the lights should be on, else they should be off. Next is a function called to update lights. This function takes into account both override state and light state to perform all the digital write operations to the transistors and the optocoupler. If either the override state or light state are true, then all the output pins are assigned to high, turning on the lights. One might argue that if all the pins act in the same way, they should be truncated to reduce hardware requirements. This is true, but I'm hoping to include more complicated behavior in the future, and so I wanted to keep everything separate. The second last section of the code inside the loop is responsible for maintaining the operation of the clock. This will make sense when analyzed along with the clock timer ISR function. The clock timer ISR function is very simple. All it does is increment the seconds variable once every second. All other clock operations are taken care of in the main loop. Inside the main loop, a trickle-down operation occurs. A series of if statements monitor each time variable, second, minutes, and hours, and check if the next larger unit of time should be incremented. If seconds overrun to above 59, then minute is incremented and seconds are set back to zero, indicating the start of the next minute. This occurs for minutes and hours in the same way. This creates a clock functionality. The last section of code is simply diagnostic. When I had the controller plugged into my computer, I wanted to check that the clock was working. And so having the serial monitor display the time was very useful. Okay, so what does this all come together to form? The LED is mounted to a dowel which is suspended above the plants. In the future, I hope to put on some reflectors to decrease the light lost to the surroundings by directing the light towards the plants only. So far, it's been working pretty well. I used the indicator that if the lights were doing any good, the seedlings would turn towards the bulbs. Some of the smaller plants seem to have done so, which makes me happy. As a quick aside, you may be wondering how I set the clock on the controller. Well, it's a bit of a trick. The time the controller starts at can be set by changing the initialization values of the hours, minutes, and seconds variables. If I want to set up the controller, I'll pick a time about 20 minutes into the future, program the controller with that time, plug in the controller and get it running, then when it's actually the time I chose, I'll tap the reset button on the Arduino, and the initialization values will now be the correct time. That's it for this one. If you have any questions about the project, please comment. Check the description for links and more information. The code for this project is posted on my website, so you can check it out there also. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.